Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. The church and preschool are dismissed. Go be with Miss Janie. Glory to God. And then the rest of you can go ahead and open your Bibles to the sixth chapter of the book of Luke. Um, I've had my coat on long enough. It is warm in here. I don't know what happened. They started out, the air conditioning was great. And somebody downtown decided that the air conditioning didn't need to be on. I wish they would come down here and run it from here. You'd f they'd find out a different tune, wouldn't they? Amen, amen. All right, you little guys, out of here. Glory to God. N not that we don't want you, but you know you need to go next door. Hallelujah. Be in your class with Miss Janie. She'll have a good time with you. Those that are with us, if you're visiting, you're welcome to be with us at the end of the service. If you watch my internet close enough, come on over. we got food. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, Luke chapter 6. We'll start in verse 39. Hallelujah. This is right after what we just quoted about giving, it shall be given. And it says, and then Jesus spoke a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall, not, shall they not both fall into the ditch? And the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Now let me understand, most of the time when the uh, Bible translates the word and uses the word perfect, it is usually in reference to maturity and not flawlessness okay usually usually references uh, maturity and not and, and not flawlessness so he's not, he's not everyone that is flawless but everyone that's mature okay um everyone that is mature should be at his master as we grow in christ we become more like him can you say amen all right why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye either how canst thou uh, canst thou say to thy brother brother let me pull out the mote that is in thy eye when thyself beholdest that not the beam that is in your own eye. The, thou hypocrite, cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. Now, a lot of people use this scripture to run around and say, you can't judge, can't judge, can't judge. He said, get the one out of your eye so you can see clearly to help. The Bible in reference to not judging is a reference to unjust judgment. Not not judging. You have to read the whole context of all the Bible. You know, um, there, there's a lot of, there's a, you know, uh, if it was so, because you, you get some people in narratives and you'll think, uh, what happened to Ananias and Sapphire? You got people now saying that God did not strike down Ananias and Sapphire. Hogwash. It was Peter that did it. Are you kidding me? Only by the authority granted by God. You got people running around with a narrative, you know, uh, what Peter didn't, I mean, God didn't strike down Ananias and Sapphire. Peter did. And the church grew. Read it. The church grew. Hallelujah. Just, just don't, don't get hooked up on narratives that are narrow and not allowing the rest of the Bible to bring light and to bring balance to it. Now, I'm not compromised with balance. Okay? For a good tree bringeth forth not corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bringeth forth uh, evil fruit. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Or a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. Are you here? And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now let me stop right there. You got people running around today saying, I can do this, I can, I can do anything I want to do. I can cuss, I can smoke, I can drink, I can dip, I can, get, I can shoot, I can shoot up, I can run around with women, I can run around, I can be, you know, I can be homosexual, I can be heterosexual, I can be bisexual, I can be transgender, I can be Q, I can be Z, I can be we, I can be plus. But if you're walking with God, you're what God has made you. Amen? And you got Christians running around saying, we shouldn't judge people, we shouldn't be nothing. Wait, 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 wait. You haven't been spending enough time in the Word. Because what's going to come out of you is what the, is what the Word says. I, I, don't dis, I don't disdain or hate people who are living in a rebellion to God. I want to get them free. I can't get them free telling them it's okay to do what they're doing. Hello? You can't correct something until you know it's wrong. You can't get people delivered from sin until they know what sin is. The law was given to show what sin was. 
and to prove we couldn't live up to God's standard and our own ability, it was going to take the grace of God, the out, you know, a gift of God called Jesus Christ to redeem us from sin. But, you know, the law was still given to show us that we were utterly sinful. Not so we could, you know, go, well, now grace has come. I don't have to do anything. Uh, you're just crazy. You're acting crazy anyway. And why call ye me Lord, Lord? <laughs> Stop. And do not the things which I say. This is not my sermon, but I got, I got to do, do this. The Bible says that we're not, you're not saved because you confessed your sins. We talked about this in our Wednesday night Bible study on the new birth. You're not saved because you got water baptized, you took First Communion, you took uh, whatever, what do they call those classes? Um, confirmation classes and canon classes? Uh, catechisms. You're not saved because you did any of that. You're not saved because you shook the preacher's hand. You're not saved because you signed the roll book. Paul wrote to the church at Rome and said, you're saved because you declare that he is the Lord of your life and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Lord of your life. You yield to the Lordship of Jesus. And Jesus said, why well, call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say. So I hate to tell you, baby, you're supposed to obey once you get saved. What the things Jesus says to do. And you can't go so find some isolated scripture and pull it out and make it be the only thing you're supposed to do. He's got stuff you're supposed to do. And we don't have time for that. All right. Because we're going to win over the storms of life. All right. That was, that was a side journey. That one was for free. Don't even have to send an offering for that one. Hallelujah. You don't have to send an offering for any of it. It's all free. Hallelujah. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth the saying, my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man that which built that house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them not. Are you here? We don't want to be, you know, I want to be like the one that doeth them. He heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house. And again, uh, a house upon the earth, against the, which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Thank you. Hallelujah. Now, let's stop here. Now, anybody who knows anything about construction, you know you just can't go out and start building your house on the dirt. You, you could, now, listen, you're in, say you're in the middle of a dry season. Ground's real hard. You go out and just start putting, you know, start putting down and build, put your, you know, maybe level the ground, but put your, your, your uh, runners across there, your, your floor trusses, you know, and, and build the house up, and it sits all up there nice and pretty. And then next door over there, they're building the house, and they're digging down. And guys go, what are you doing that for? I'm building the foundation. You don't need to do that. Let's take the shortcut. Now, when they get done, the houses look the same. They look just alike. I mean, you know, build identical houses. You could build identical houses, same lap siding, same siding. You could build it, you know, um, uh, what's that new term? That term, the uh, craftsman. The craftsman style of the partial brick and the, you know, the post at the angles and that kind of stuff. Even the shotgun craftsman house. You go all the way through. Remember shotgun, the front door, the back door, shoot a shotgun, go all the way through. Hallelujah, that's where they got that name from. Hallelujah. You know, and when they get done, they look just alike. Got the same trim, same paint, same everything. Look just alike. And they'll, stay, and they'll, they'll sit right there until the storms come. Now, the first time you get water too high, the house next door is going to start sinking. Because the ground's going to get soft and there's no foundation under it. There's nothing where it was dug down. Now, let me tell you something. You don't want to go across a bridge that, doesn't, that you know, uh, wasn't dug down and deep. Now, how many know that when they start building these bridges over the interstate, you'll see the overpasses or whatever, and you'll go out there, and you'll see that, that rebar up in the air, and they're pouring concrete over and all that kind of stuff? What you don't know, maybe, is that before they ever started putting that rebar up, they came out there with these pile drivers and drove I-beams down, down, down. And then they got a certain put, put another on top of it, welded it together, and boom, 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 until they hit bedrock. And then that whole concrete pier is attached to that I-beam that goes down into bedrock. You better hope it is. <laughs> Are you here? Because if not, one day a bad, uh, you know, a bad storm or, a, you know, something coming on, an earthquake, I mean, you're in trouble. All right? Jesus said the man that hears his sayings and does them is the man who's digging deep. The man or woman who, does, who hears them but doesn't do them. I ain't got to do that. You know, this, this is the Pirates of the Caribbean. Parlay is not a rule, it's a, more of a suggestion. Huh? More like a guideline. All right? Captain Barbosa's guidelines, not, 
you know, you know, a, a rule or a law. God's word is not a guideline. Hello, it's not suggestions. It is the answer to life. It is the key to victory. Are you here? If you think that because you came into the kingdom, you can keep living like you were living and go make it and be win, be a winner, you're you're deceiving yourself. You will not win living like the world. Why? Because the world is designed to defeat you. That went over big, but it is. The world is designed to defeat you. What, what are the three things that Jesus said you do? You've got to come to him. You've got to hear his sayings, and then you've got to do them. Real simple, isn't it? Come to Jesus, get born again, hear what he says, and go out and do it. Wow, that's not hard. You've got people running around preaching sermons like, come to Jesus, and then do whatever you want to do because you're under grace. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't change anything. Oh, dear Lord. You know what? Then Paul should have never been born again and wrote anything. God didn't need Paul to write squat. Hello? The, the whole New Testament should be, accept Jesus and you're going to heaven, that's it. Doesn't matter how you live, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter how, just you're going to heaven. But that's not what we have. We have a bunch of writing about this life that God's given us and how to live victorious in it. Can you say amen? And it means come and do what Jesus said do. Live the way he said live. Now listen, not in your power. We know it's not in our power. Paul wrote and said, you know, that when, that when I reach the end of me, I rejoice in my weakness. I rejoice in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Can you say amen? So we got to dig deep. You got to build your house on the rock. You got to dig down. Uh, Colossians 2, 2 says this through 8. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, and whom are hid all the mysteries of uh, treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile, beguile you through enticing words. Is it not enticing? I can keep living just like I was living before I got saved, and it's okay. Boy, that's enticing. Hello? Are you here? Oh, that's enticing. You're being beguiled. I said you're being beguiled. The enemy wants to beguile you. He'll use people to do it. For though I be, uh, though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, bejoying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Folks, I want to tell you a secret here this morning. I remember that old song by, um, I think it's Gary Puckett and Union Gap's Baby Willpower. It's now or never, willpower, it's now or never. Let me tell you something, folks. <laughs> that's Ed's version of Gary Puckett and Union Gap's, and that's all you're getting this morning. <laughs> you're not getting young girl, get out of my mind or anything else, all right? Okay? Your willpower is not enough. If you are depending on your ability through your willpower to win, you're going to get your back end kicked in. Satan will whip you and take you to the mat and stomp you and knock you around if you're depending on your willpower. Are you here? You've got to walk in Christ. You've got to let the greater one rise up on the inside of you. You've got to put your trust in him who was and is and is to come, the first, the last, the alpha, the omega, glory to God, who who has the keys of death, hell, and the grave, glory to God, who's risen up and sat at the right hand of the Father and sent the great and mighty Paracletos to take residence up in you so that we can say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Can you say amen? You're going to have to, he says, if you, as you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. Can you say amen? Glory to God. And uh, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therewith with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men and the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Now, no, why do they use the word Christ? Now, you know, most of you should know by now, and you walk with the Lord, Christ is not his last name. The title of Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is the name given him in his earthly embodiment and also in his resurrection, the name that's above every name. And Christ is what he is, the anointed one. The, both the Hebrew word Hamashiach and the Greek word Christos mean the same exact same thing, the anointed one. And it is, hallelujah, we are not to be de de deceived through philosophies and vain deceit of the rudiments of this world, but through Christ, the anointed one. What? The anointing destroys the yoke and removes the burden. Christ was sent to destroy and remove the effect and the power of the rudiments of this world off of your life. Not to bind you to them. Or not to give you liberty to enjoy them. He was sent to break that. And let me tell you something, folks. Your willpower is not enough. But his anointing is. Hallelujah. Jesus said, he whom the Son has set free is free indeed, glory to God. I want you to know that whatever you face, whatever storm of life comes against you, whatever is, is, is assailing against you, when you dig your life to the rock of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and put your trust in him, there is an anointing available, an anointing present to destroy the power of this world off of your life so you can walk free and walk victorious and walk in liberation, glory to God. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Amen. The Word of God is, is, the, is the foundation of this world. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2, 20 and 22, or through 22, are, and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Oh, glory to God. Everything Paul wrote was built on Jesus. Everything Peter wrote was built on Jesus. Everything the prophets spoke and said was built on the cornerstone of Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. He is that which everything is measured from. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? When Paul begins to give revelation, he is revealing Christ and his redemptive work in humanity. God did not send Jesus to bring his life and his love to you, to deliver you so you can run around and get on Facebook and tell these stupid things like you can fornicate all you want to because you're under grace. It don't matter. He came to liberate you from that. We got people looking for ways to, to justify what they're doing. No, 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 no. Listen, let me, so you, got, you got two sides. You got people who are, who are looking to, to justify what they're doing. And say, I'm under grace, it doesn't matter. And that is, that is an extreme misinterpretation of grace. Oh, the grace of God is beautiful. But by grace we're saved through faith, that not of yourselves. My faith receives what God did through grace. Hallelujah, can you say amen? Not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm under the grace of God. I live by the grace of God. But I am telling you, the grace of God does not empower you to do what you, you want to do and what you did before. Amen. Then you got the other side, people who condemn themselves all the time. And a lot of times what happens is, in an attempt to get these people to not feel so bad about themselves, you know, we, we, oh, well, God loves you no matter what, and, and, and you take a message, and then you keep pushing it and push it too far, where God loves you no matter what. Yes, he does. He loves you in your darkest, I mean, darkest, dingiest, most disgusting hour that you can imagine. He loves you there. And he sent Jesus to... Not just to put his arms around you and leave you there. While you were sinking. And you cry out to the Lord. The Lord catches your hand. And you go back to the boat together. He didn't drag you back. God lifts you up through Jesus. Out of that mire. Out of that dark place. Remember Peter? Lord, if that should bid me, Come. Come. Peter hops out and comes over there. Then he gets caught up with the storm and the waves and all that kind of stuff. Listen, he gets caught up with the things of life. And he begins to sink. Well, Jesus didn't drag him back to the boat. Come on, Peter. You old, sorry, non-believing rascal. They went back to the boat together. Stood on the water again. When, God, when, Jesus, when, G, when you turn to Jesus, he reaches his hand out and grabs your hand and picks you up and you walk back together. You walk out of that place that looks like a place of defeat, that looks like a place where the storm is taking you down, that looks like you can't win. He takes you up out of that place and you walk with him back into, back into a safe harbor, back into a safe place with God. Can you say amen? 
I said, can you say amen? Then you get the extremes over here. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. God says it's all right. No, he didn't. I said, no, he didn't. Don't you slap Jesus in the face, him coming and shedding his blood and dying on the cross and becoming sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him by saying it's okay to keep doing what he came to deliver me from. Somebody shout glory. All right. Where was I? Oh. In whom the building fitly joined together, framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in God, in the Lord, in whom you also build it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Oh, my goodness. No, it's not. Is it 12 o'clock? <laughs> okay. All you that just joined us from the Central Time Zone, thank you. We're now at 11 o'clock. We're joining you guys. Oh, my, my, my. Now, I'm going to sing that old Ramos song. I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up. Hallelujah. I'm just warming up with my sermon today. Hallelujah. All right. Mark chapter 4. We're, just, we're going to kind of get, get into the edge of this. We'll finish this up next week. We're Mark 4, 2 through 20. Uh, he taught them many things by parables and said unto him in his doctrine. Now, everybody, you know, how many remember when Bush you know, went out and bombed and uh, preemptively bombed over in Iraq and everything? They called that the Bush doctrine. Well, you know, Jesus had a doctrine. Y'all know Jesus had a doctrine? Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to, this is doctrine. That's what it said. He's teaching it in a parable, but it's his doctrine. It came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Another fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now let me tell you something, folks. When the Bible says, He that has ears to hear, let him hear, and he's talking about these things. It's talking about spiritual ears. God is asking you to tune in with your spirit and not your head. And let your spirit man hear what God has to say. Don't filter it through your preconceived ideas. Don't filter it through your church doctrine manual. I mean, you know, when I joined my church, you know, I believe that Jesus, you know, we went through and said, you know, uh, uh, we had to get out the manual. We had to read. They would read and say, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And well, I do. Of course I do. Do you believe in sanctification as a second definite work of grace? If you, some of you who know that, you know what church I was in. Hallelujah. Yes, I do. Do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking in other tongues? Yes, I do. Do you believe in the operation in the present-day church of the nine manifestations of gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yes, I do. Do you believe in divine healing as in the atonement? Yes, I do. You know, we go around down through that. Well, I, you know, come to find out that we want atonement for, we're covered, we're purchased, we're redeemed. We're in, we're in redemption, not atonement. And I grew out, I grew a little bit, you know, some, but, you know, uh, but when I, that's how we did it. We had, we, had, we had to confess and say we believed that doctrine of the church. Can you say amen? Jesus says, this is doctrine, and he says, now hear with your spiritual ears, not your physical ears. Hear what the Holy Ghost is saying to the churches. Book of Revelation says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God's looking for you to, to get past, you know, uh, your mind and let your spirit hear from the Holy Spirit and communion with him. One of the ways to do that is to be filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Calm yourself by praying in the Spirit. Calm your mind. Calm everything. Calm your flesh. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in other tongues, other, in other words, until you, everything calms down. Then you can, hear, you can hear clearly what God says. That's why Jesus went away to pray, got away from the clutter, got away from all the noise. He had to get away and get himself set aside so he could hear what the Spirit said. Amen. And when he was done, they were, about, they were with him. The twelve asked him of the parable. He said, unto you it is given to know the mystery um, of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. 
that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? Now listen to this next statement, folks. And how then will you know all parables? Now we're talking about the master key of understanding everything. Everything in the, in, the, in the New Testament doctrine and teaching is understood by understanding this parable. It unlocks the key to everything. Y'all hear you going home. That's what Jesus said. If you don't understand this, how are you going to understand anything? This is the one. This is the biggie. This is the master key. How many, how many have ever had a master key? Boy, it's cool. Now, back in the other building we were in, I had a master key. Every, every lock in the building, my key fit. Now, we didn't give everybody a master key. Well, number one, they didn't need to be in my office. Number two, some people didn't need to be in the audio room. Why? Because they let their kids go in there and mess up the soundboard. We come in, on, that's before we got the digital board, which was like, hallelujah, because, you know, somebody let their kids in there and they mess up the soundboard. We go back in and they go, button, 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 and they all went back to where it was. Before that, you had to get the picture out you took of the soundboard and go, Because they sit down, they sit down and begin to worship practice, and it'd be all over the place. It would be like, you know, you felt like you listened to Helter Skelter by the Beatles or something. I mean, it was awful. But that master key was great. Because somebody said, Pastor, I need a key to the kitchen. Hey, here's my key. Is it right? Which one is it? This one. I need a key to the olive room. This. Which one is it? This one. I need a key to the back door. It's this one. It unlocks everything. Hallelujah. Are you here? The sower soweth the word. So what's the first step in understanding everything? That the word takes preeminence. Do you want victory in life? The word has your answer. Hello? You may be waiting for evangelist so-and-so to show up with their tent and have a special meeting and lay hands on you and get you free. And I, mean, I thank God for anointings. I thank God for ministries. Don't mind tent revivals. Don't mind in-house revivals. Don't mind Coliseum revivals. You know, but I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to live on a consistent, victorious basis, you're going to have to be in the Word. We thank God for the anointings. But I can tell you if, you, if you don't mix the Word with it, you can lose it. And that's what Brother Hagin said. He back in the, in the healing revival, he was going to the churches and coming back the next year, and 80% of the people he had prayed for had gotten insulin. I mean, miracle, miracle, people off of stretchers, people with terminal disease, all kinds of, 80% of the people that got healed were back again with the same disease. And he went to the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, what is this? Why is this? He said, they're not, get, they're not getting enough word to keep it. And that's when he started having what he called faith seminars. And on the morning services, he would just teach on faith. Not necessarily faith for healing, but, you know, that would be a part of it. But faith, how to receive from God. And after, after a period of that, about a year, he started going back to these same churches, and 80% of people were keeping their healing. Why? Because the Word got in there, and they, began, they knew how to take the Word of God and hold their ground and stand their ground with the, with the Word of God. The anointing got them free, set them, got, got them healed and delivered, but the Word kept them. I said, the Word kept them. Can you say glory? The sower soweth the Word, not as opinion. Not what will sell his latest tape series. Not what will get more money into the church, but the word. Hello? That went over big. Thank you. Can I get a, can I get a help me Jesus at least? The, uh, and so the source so with the word. And these are by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, have heard, Satan cometh immediately. Taketh away the word that is sown in their hearts. These are the likewise which are sown on stony ground. When they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Have no root in themselves, and so endure but a time. And after when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. I'm going to tell you something. You better be careful about being offended. Because Satan is going to use that offense to draw and to wither and kill the word in your life. What do I do? 
Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall by any means offend them. I'm telling you, you you're just going to have to love the word more than you, you love, you hate what they did to you. Because people can do some nasty stuff. Christians can be instruments of the devil. Well, not quite. Christians can be the devil. Lord, help me recover from that one. All right. No, but Christians can be given over to, to, to being used as an instrument from the devil to, to wreak havoc on people's lives, to hurt their lives, to bring destruction to their lives. That, that's the work of the enemy. And some people are yielded to that. Some people are just, they are emissaries of the devil. They're not even born again. They just come out like it and, and try to mess up churches. John Osteen was one time, he was on a plane. I'll just tell you how, how long ago this was. And um, he was sitting beside a, a guy, and, and uh, the, the person came out and was offering them something. The guy says, no, I'm fasting today. And he says, oh, are you a Christian? He says, no, I'm a Satanist. Oh, really? Well, why are you fasting? He said, we're fasting today to, to, uh, to destroy pastors or Christian, or Christian ministers' marriages. We're using our fast to release demonic powers to go and to destroy marriages of pastors of churches. Well, you messed up the pastor and his wife, you messed up the church. That's why all these MLMs, the multi-level market groups, want to get the pastor. They want to get them into their, their group because they get the church. You mess up the pastor, you mess up the church. You scatter the sheep. Hello? Are you here? There's, there's, there's more damage done than just your marriage when you're doing some couch time with the secretary in the church office at, at, at midnight. You're messing up the sheep. You're hurting them. You're messing up their life. Your lack of integrity has a far further reaching effect than you realize. Just because you want to cater to your flesh. Where was I? Immediately taketh away the word sown in the heart. These are likewise sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, have no root in themselves, and so endure. But a time after, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And um, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word. And it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. I'm talking about real quick. I, I know this is, how many give me 30 seconds? One, two, three, four, five. That's only two and a half minutes. Okay, three minutes. All right. Anybody give me 15 minutes? All right, thank you, Ellie. All right, Ellie did it. See, got no, look, you're going to take the people who came three weeks ago. Now, now they're here for the third week in a row. You're going to throw them out because they raised their hand? <laughs> All right. Five things that cause the word to be unfruitful or unproductive in your life or kill it. Affliction. Affliction is, it references sufferings due to the pressure of circumstances or the antagonism of persons. Circumstances or people can afflict you. And you're, you're coming to hear the word and you're trying to feed on the word of God and here comes, you know, the devil using circumstances against you. People against you. Are you here? And then when that persecution uh, arises, you know, it, it comes to get that word out of your heart. Hallelujah. Why? You get offended. And when you get offended, you can't receive from God. Because the offense takes up root in your heart. Persecution means to put, to put the flight, to drive away, to pursue. Hence the meaning to persecute. Satan will pursue you. He'll use circumstances like people to pursue you. To come against you. I've had people get mad with me and leave our church and be gone for years. And somebody that's in our church runs into them somewhere. And what do they do? I, I know this for a fact. That's what they tell me. Yeah, I saw so-and-so the other day. 
Oh, yeah, how's he doing? Well, he saw me, and the first thing he says, I want to tell you one thing about Pastor Ed. Hadn't seen, hadn't been in our church in years. They're, perse- they're coming against us. They hadn't seen him in years. And what it was, you want to know what it was? I told his girlfriend that he and her didn't need to be living together. If they're going to get together and have sex, they need to get married. And she told him he got mad and made her leave the church. Why? Because he thought he was Marvin Gaye. Not just, not just let's get it on, but the sequel, keep getting it on. Marvin had another song after, let's get it on, to keep getting it on, let's keep getting it on. Let's stop. He persecuted me because I told her what the words. You can't live, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep fornicating. He got mad. Who's he think he is? I'm the pastor. Hello? They asked me a question. I told them what the Bible says. You don't like that? Take it up with Jesus. No, they take it up with the, they take it up with me. They come after Pastor Ed. Are you here? I win in the end. That's right. Third, he said, Jesus said this. He said, um, the son on the stony ground, they hear the word and receive it with gladness, have no root in themselves, endure for a season, and after persecution arise. And then uh, verse 18, skip there. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. The cares of this world, what a care, to draw away in different directions, to drive away, to pursue, I mean, I'm sorry, to, drive, to draw to, in different directions, to distract, hence, signifies that which causes this, a care, especially an anxious care. The cares of this world. You get drawn away. The word's over here, but the cares of this world will keep drawing you over to the cares of this world. And you're anxious. You've got anxiety all the time. And what does it do? It'll choke the word. It'll, it'll suffocate the word. The deceitfulness of riches. Huh. Now, we are a word of faith. Name it, claim it, frame it, grab, blab it, and grab it bunch over here at Faith and Victory Church. We are a word of faith. We do believe in the power of confessing what God's word says about circumstances. We do believe in conf- the power of confessing God's word. But we are not a name it, claim it, blab it, or grab it bunch. That's what the people who outside call us. The name it and frame it and blab it, grab it, blab it and grab it. Now, some in our camp, I was like one guy said one time, let's face it, there are some squirrels in our camp. There are some granola Christians, fruits, nuts, and flakes packaged together in the same box. But there are. But the truth of the matter is, I believe in biblical prosperity. Biblical prosperity. What's that mean? I don't have a thousand-fold anointing, and you're going to get you know, a million dollars tomorrow morning if you give me a hundred today. I don't believe you give up to the higher anointing to get blessed. I believe you give according to the Word of God. Tithe and offer comes to the storehouse. If, if you lend to the poor, you give to the Lord, he will repay. Hallelujah. I believe that when you do what God tells you to do in, in any kind of seed, he causes the return to come in proportion to what he said. That you know, every man give as, or, as he purposes in his own heart, cheerfully, not begrudgingly, or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. But it's as you purpose in your heart. It is not a message where the preacher gets rich so you can, you know, you can get rich. Now, some of that stuff has been self-serving and self-servant and ungodly. Pastor, you're shooting yourself in the foot. No, because God takes care of me. Amen. If God speaks to you, I know you'll obey. But I'm not going to put, put some blow wind up your skirt and whisper in your ear that if you'll give me $100 today, if you give to the higher, I'm the higher anointing today, you're going to have, you know, $1,000 tomorrow and got testimonies about it. No. See, the deceitfulness of riches. Are you here? Deceit, deceit means to cheat, to deceive, to beguile. That which gives a false impression, whether by appearance, statement, or influence, instead of riches. To give a false impression by influence. Ministers, you have to be careful. And if you're watching me, you've got to be aware and you have to have the right heart and keep your integrity right so that you don't give, use your influence 
to present a false impression concerning money. You have to be careful. Now, I'm not being full of care. I mean, you have to be aware. You have to be cautious as you proceed down those lines. Yes, you want your people to have faith to give. You want your people to have faith to live. You want your people to have faith, you know, in the arena of finances. But don't use that influence to line your pockets with gold while they're going broke. Brother Hagin used to say there are the three G's of ministry. God, I mean, uh, the, the, the gold, the glory, and the girls. Watch out for all three. Watch out for the money. Watch out for getting lifted up and proud about how great you are. Stop, you don't open up your service with how great I am. How great I am. <laughs> Hello. You know, if it weren't for me, this ministry would go under. <laughs> Baby, if it's God, it'll stand whether you're here or not. Are you here or you go home? So you got to you know, you watch out for the gold. You got to watch out for money. You write heart about money. You got to watch out for the, for the glory. You got to watch out and keep your pride right. And let me tell you, you better watch out for the girls. Because there are some Jezebels out there. And they are not after your body. They're after your power. Hello. Because I've seen some good looking women go after some ugly men. Oh, my good friend, Fawaz. Hey, Fawaz, my, my, my Jordanian friend, God loves you, man. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And so the deceitfulness of riches, be careful. As a believer, the deceitfulness of riches will choke the word. When you start, let me tell you something, folks. I had um, a number of years ago, we had a guy come down, and, and he was from Namibia, uh, which was southwest Africa. It changed back to its name when they got, when they got, their own constitution got free from British rule. They, they changed back to Namibia. And he was the minister there, and he'd been to our church before. And he had just come from a camp meeting somewhere. And he said they had that woman up there was getting gold dust everywhere. And he was in that, there were 3,000 people in that service. She was from down in Brazil. By the way, she's dead now. But she would, gold, supposed gold dust would appear on people's Bibles. And then they take up an offering. Now, I get a little sarcastic over this stuff sometimes. Why don't you just bring all the Bibles up and dump the gold dust in a box and give it back to you? Right. There's your offer for the night. Hello? I mean, if you can get the gold dust up here in everybody's Bible, let them take it and give it back in, in an offering, and then you've got your ministry to cover. Why well, take up an offering? But people dumped huge amounts of money in the offering. Now, he said that, that was like, he said, and what she shared and ministered on had no, had no meat to it, had no uh, depth to it, had nothing in it. Next night, I had this young guy up there, young minister, preach. He said he had, he, had a, he had a solid word from God. He was full of faith, the Holy Ghost. He ministered with power. He said 80 people were in the building. Wow. See, if you're not careful, you get caught up following after stuff, particularly where you're going to get rich. I'm telling you, have a, have a hole in this seminar and see how many people show up. <laughs> yeah, there are a few. That's exactly what I have. A few will show up. Have a... You can have what you say and get rich quick overnight when you give $100 to the superpower anointed guest speaker tonight service and see what happens. You'll pack it out. And they'll fill the offering buckets up. Be careful, ministers. We cannot use our influence to mislead people. Give, time, sow in accordance with the word and teach your people to be led by the spirit and not by an influence of somebody preaching. Somebody came up to me that one night, gave me a $100 bill, walked out of the building. Somebody gave him $10,000. I got him up testifying in the next service. What are you doing? You're using that manipulation to get bigger offerings. You're not doing it to inspire faith. Watch out for the gold. Watch out for the glory. Watch out for the girls. The deceitfulness of riches will choke the word. We believe in biblical prosperity. I believe that if you're a tither and a giver, that what God said will work. Heaven's windows. Now, you may not be having Robin Leach show up next week and start doing a, a, a television show on you as the lifestyles of the rich and famous. I don't even know if he's still alive. 
You know, got your $20 million yacht. We, see, we start counting our yachts and we start counting our extra houses on the Riviera and all this kind of stuff when why does God want you to obtain wealth? He wants me blessed. He wants you blessed to be a blessing. You have to, as a believer, make the end result of all that God does in your life to making you fruitful and useful to expand the kingdom to get more people in. Because I'm going to tell you, there's not a house, there's not a boat, there's not a car, there's not a, a sunset, there's not an island on this planet that will compare to what God has for us in heaven. Now, God don't want you to beat down poor and groveling in the, in the, in the dirt to, get, to barely get by. But we've got to get back to understanding our prosperity is so we can advance the kingdom primarily. God does want you blessed. I believe that. But when we, fight, when we um, major or put the emphasis on us getting blessed, boy, when I get on, well, I'm believing for my Maserati. And Leroy is over here believing God for a bicycle. And you're going to take your $250,000, you're going to run and say, look, look at how prosperous I am. Now, you got a business and you're doing, you know, but if you're a preacher and you're out here and you're believing God for Maseratis, I heard Dad Hagen say it one time. He said, I'm believing God right now for the ministry. For the ministry. He said, we're, really, we're believing God right now for a 500, one time gift of $500,000. He said, what are you going to do with it when you get it? He said, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with it. We're going to put it right back into the ministry. We're going to print more books. We're going to make more tapes. We're going to reach more people. We're going to do more for the kingdom of God than we've ever done before. See, his, the reason he was believing God for the money was he had to get to more people. He had to reach more people. Don't let the deceitfulness of riches entrap you so that all you can think about is living on easy street. How many houses you can have. Every, now listen, God wants, doesn't want you living paycheck to paycheck. And God doesn't want you broke. And God won't, don't want you defeated. God don't want you, you know, having to get some burlap sacks from the tobacco barn and sew them together to make a dress. <laughs> now you, now, listen, if you're from Eastern Carolina, they used to do that. They go take the tobacco sheets and cut them up and make clothes out of them. Now I'm going to tell you something. We used to lay on those burlap things at the tobacco barn. We took the barns out. We put them all in there and tie them up and get up there and lay them under the shed when it rained and stuff. That, they're, they're not for wearing. <laughs> Just let me tell you, they're, they're scratchy. Hello. God, we're not talking about putting you back in, in, in absolute despair and poverty. But keep your heart right. Here's, it's really the key to this. Keep your heart right. Don't be deceived so you begin to pursue the riches so that they choke the word in your life. Because so you can get so caught up with being prosperous and having all this stuff that you forget the guy that God's telling you to go minister to and bless. Well, that's my, you, that, they just need to use their faith. Our church, back the church I came out of one time called a, a national minister and uh, they were trying to get him to come preach there. And they got, to, after two weeks of calling, they finally got the secretary. And the secretary says, well, you're going to have to call back on another day. And, 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 sec, and our secretary said, well, I've been trying to call for two weeks. She said, well, honey, you just got to use your faith. That's arrogance. Hello? Don't get so arrogant and deceived about your prosperity that you, you demand other people use their faith. When God's telling you to help, God's telling you to be a blessing. God's telling you to minister. Can you say amen? And the last thing, here we go. Make them down that girl's thing. The lust of other things entering in. Lust denotes strong desire. Now it's used three times in the New Testament in a good sense. Luke twenty two fifteen. Philippians 1.23 and 1 Thessalonians 2.17. That's the only place it's used in a good sense. The rest of the time it's used to denote evil lust, fleshly lust, ungodly desires. All right? You can let the lust of other things take the word of God's effect out of your life. You can become lustful over people, women, men if you're a woman. If it's the other way, you need more help than that. Hello? Uh, I said so. All right? You can, you can have lust for money. You can have lust for possessions. You can have lust for food. Hello? Can't even stay in the service till 12 o'clock because you've got to get to the restaurant and beat the Presbyterians. Oh, my God. If you didn't beat them, you could sure got to beat the Baptist. 
Are you here? We don't want to stand in line. Now, I'm, I'm not going to tell off. I, I, I know some people that used to leave church and, and, and run down to a restaurant and, and go to Sunday school and leave church because they didn't want to have to stand in line to eat the food. <laughs> we, we would. It was good food, too. <laughs> Eastern style barbecue and fried chicken. Glory. But you know, we can have lust for other things. So much for sleep, for television, for possession. There's all kinds of things we can have lust for other things in and have it take the Word of God's effect out of our life. So affliction, persecutions, um, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things. All that can enter in and cause the Word of God not to produce in our life. Well, you want to win? So do you want to win? Let, hear G, go to Jesus. Hear Jesus. Do what Jesus said. That is such a simple, it's not, it's not a formula. It's the truth. It's, it's, it's just how you do it. You, let, you submit to his lordship. You hear what he has to say through his word. Now let me tell you something. Not just, his new, not just when he was on the earth and we have it in the gospels. His, his, the, the New Testament teaching uh, is the word of Christ. He is the logos of God. He's the complete embodiment of the word. He's the whole word. He's the whole counsel of the word. Amen? Hear it and do it. Be you do it. James said, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Amen? Father, we thank you for all those who joined us today, whether by internet or here in this building. We thank you that you've ministered to them, and they had this, this, this small, simple instructions. Go to Jesus. Take what he says in his word, him or by the, via the doctrine of the church, and do it. And see victory in their life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, because when the storm comes, you'll be like him that's built on the rock. The waves, the stream will beat on it, the, the wind will blow, and it'll stand against the storm. How many of you have ever gone, look, been down to the beach, seen all, all these cottages up on stilts? Why are they up on stilts? Because if they put it on the ground, it's going to get washed away when the storm comes in. Hello? Get your house built on the rock. Can you say amen? All right. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night for our midweek service. Join us if you haven't. Join our Facebook page when you'll know, be notified exactly when we go live. God bless you. Until then, we see you again. God bless you. Hallelujah. We love you. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.